I have the thumbs up. We are good to go. Welcome everybody who is here. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joined uh, from home and uh, it's good to come together. And let's remember what we're about as we come together. We're here to worship. We're here to lift our minds and high towards the living God. We're going to uh, begin with some words from the Bible which will help us to uh, lift our minds to remind us of uh, every reason we have to praise God. So Ephesians 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We are blessed people, and so we have every reason to praise God. So let's uh, do that with uh, the words of uh, praise my soul, the King of Heaven, great hymn based on Psalm 103. Let's stand and sing God's praise. going to approach God in prayer now. Please uh, do follow as I lead us. So let's come and seek God together. Our God, what uh, reasons we have to be thankful this morning and to praise your great name. As we have just sung, uh, we in the Lord Jesus Christ are ransomed, healed, restored and forgiven people. And uh, what great things these are, all of which have been given and uh, lavished upon us by you, the living God. And Lord, I pray that we may 
never tire of giving thanks or acknowledging you for who you are, the great God of heaven. And as we uh, ponder then all these great and wonderful gifts and where they come from, uh, we pray that you would lift us beyond the, the gifts themselves, the great blessings that we receive, to the, to the God who has given them to us, to, to realize who you are and what you are like in your very heart. What a beautiful and wonderful God you are, the living God, the God from eternity to eternity, the holy God, the God who is slow to anger, and swift to bless, and full of faithfulness, a God of lavish and incredible grace. And we pray that we might be taken up then with your beauty and greatness and loveliness of you, our God. You are God, and you are good. Lord, we come today with all sorts of... uh, Emotions all come in all sorts of uh, states of uh, being, of uh, uh, weariness, of uh, joy, of uh, frustration, of disappointment. Lord, you know uh, where we're at this morning, each one of us. And Lord, we pray as we uh, contemplate you, our great God, may it do our hearts good today. We pray that you would heal and restore and refresh and cleanse and energize us, we pray. So that's our desire as we come to worship, that you would hear our prayers now and answer them in and through that wonderful Saviour, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Ephesians 1 goes on like this. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Well, as we reflect on the riches of his grace, We're going to sing two songs now, Only by Grace and then Lord Be My Vision. There will be a very short reading in between the two, but just remain standing. Only by Grace and then Lord Be My Vision as we celebrate and reflect on the riches of his grace towards us.
goes on, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Lord, be my vision. <coughs> seats. Well, it's time for the children's talk now, and uh, this Hannah's going to do it, so if you'd like to come to the front, kids. Have some of these. Oh, like one. oh, a balloon, yeah. Got some balloons. 
great stuff. Oh, one for Ezra. Lots of balloons. Managed to put the perfect number up. <gasps> we had some of these as well. What do you think? What's that one, Ruben? A present. This one. God. What do you think has been happening in our house this week? Yeah. Someone's had a birthday. <gasps> Whose birthday was it, Jonathan? It was Daddy's. <laughs> but we've got, we've got a card. Oh, we haven't opened this one. Susie, do you want to open that card for us? Oh, it's, it's nobody's. Oh, yeah, it's not got a name on the front of that one, has it? Ah, can you get into it? Birthdays are fun, aren't they? All those balloons. All the cake. I've already been to a party. <gasps> well, yeah, parties. Parties are good, aren't they? We get parties on this birthday. Oh, what's the card say, Susie? 50? Nobody in our house is 50 this week. That's a bit old. Oh. <laughs> what, does it, what does it say inside, Susie? Can you read it for us? Great. Everyone at Jewsbury Evangelical Church, happy 50th birthday. Ah, so this wasn't a card for somebody in our house. This, this is a card for everybody here because Jewsbury Church is 50 years old this year. Not this building. We've not been in this building that long. But as a church family, not all of us individually, but together, being a church here in Jewsbury has been going for 50 whole years. That's, that's longer than I am old. It's quite a long time, probably a lot longer than all you are. Maybe even older than your parents. You might have to ask your grandparents if they remember it being started. 50 years. Well, we've got a present. Who wants to help me open the present? You're good for that, Reuben? Well, you can come in and help if you want. We can have a few people helping. Do you want to have a help, Sophie? Ah, what have we got for a present, everybody? Oh, oh, before we get there, though, what's an important thing? If, well, yeah, but... <laughs> If somebody gives you a present, what does your mum and dad say you have to say? Thank you. Thank you. Even if it's something you don't really want to say thank you for. We always have to say thank you when we open a present. Okay, let's get it open. Let's see what it is. The excitement. It's not anything wrong. It's a box. It's just a box. Oh. 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 Do you know what that is? A question mark. A question mark. Oh. One of those presents when your mum and dad says, oh, you've got to say thank you. You're like, oh, oh okay, to say thank you. But who are we to say thank you to? There wasn't, there wasn't even any tag on this. <coughs> nobody's, nobody's said anything in the card. Ah, well, we've got a Bible verse that might help us with this one. So hopefully this is going to come up on the screen. Oh, uh, yeah. Or should we say, uh, see what this says. Every good uh, and perfect gift is <coughs> from God. And that's from James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from God. So as a church, we don't get many presents that we unwrap. It doesn't happen very much. But we do have lots of good gifts from God that we need to say thank you to God for. Lots and lots of things that God has given us over a whole 50 years. And they might be really little things and really big things but all of them we need to say thank you to god for so adults you need to pay attention because under your chairs adults there is a little slip of paper and we've got a question mark on this box because we're not sure what we're saying thank you to god for well there is one under my chair uh, yeah you've got one under your chair you grab that one reuben so can everybody have a quick think a very quick think <laughs> how would you finish this thank you god for dot 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 at Jewsbury Evangelical Church. Have a quick think and have a write down. It just needs to be one or two words, just a very short phrase. What can we all be thankful for here at Jewsbury on our 50th birthday? So, yeah, there's lots of things you can be thankful for. You can fill in one of these two, yeah. You can chat with your parents. Think, what are you thankful for at Jewsbury? Think, even as a child, you can be thankful for the things God has given here, as here at this church. I remember that verse that every good and perfect gift is from God. The little things, the big things, everything we can trace back to God and we can say thank you to Him for that. So, as we go into this week, 
you remember that verse and think of all the things you can thank God for just in life in general but think specifically what is it that we can thank God for about our church here right now this is the really fun bit I've got a big box here we need all those slips in the big box so adults if you want to pass your slips to the end of the row once you've filled them in children can you go round and collect as many paper slips as possible and put them in my big box here please Sophie do you want to go that way not many people collecting that way <coughs> and adults if you want to fill in more than one you can just find another slip of paper somewhere we'll keep the box at the front <laughs> You gotta put them in the box. Oh wow, that's a good handful. We'll leave the box at the front for the rest of the day. So there's more things that you think of that you want to uh, put in here that we can be thankful for. Next week in the kids talk, we'll be going to go through and think about some of the things that we're thankful for as a church on our 50th birthday, our 50th anniversary. Great. Have we got all the slips in? Wow, hundreds. That's great. Perfect. Thank you all very much for joining my mini party down here. And remember, there's lots for us to be thanking God for about our church. And we're going to be thinking about that even more next week. You can go back to your seats now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, for uh, various reasons, we have uh, rejigged the preaching program slightly. So we will come back to the Sermon on the Mount in uh, two weeks' time after the anniversary. And uh, today we're going to be thinking about this passage in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, which uh, we've already read in sections, but now we're going to read it again uh, in one go, and uh, Beth Wildsmith is going to come and read it for us. Thank you. No, it's so rich, you need to hear it more than once. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in all the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us, for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfilment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Thank you. Well, we're going to uh, consider that passage in a few moments, but first of all, we're going to sing once again as we prepare to 
hear the word of God, and the song is Prepare Our Hearts or Show Us Christ. And after we have sung this, then it will be time for the, those going out to Bible explorers to do so. Uh, so let's sing together in preparation. Have a good lesson in Bible Explorers. If you'd like an outline, then they're coming round now.
Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you that you're a God who blesses and does good. And our prayer is that as we look at your word, uh, you would indeed bless us and uh, we would see the great glory of you, the living God, uh, through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray that for us all this morning and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was uh, reading in 1 Kings uh, this week and uh, came to chapter 8 where uh, they have the dedication of the temple. And this is the last verse of uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. We read this, On the following day he sent the people away. They blessed the king and then went home, joyful and glad in heart, for all the good things the Lord had done for his servant David and his people Israel. They were joyful and glad in heart for all the good things the Lord had done for them. My hope is that as we reflect on the, God's goodness in the 50th anniversary of our church, that that will be the impact it has on us, to be joyful and glad in heart. But what is striking about 1 Kings uh, 8.66 is that they were not just glad in heart because of the occasion, but because they saw how that occasion fitted into a, a bigger plan. They were glad because of what God had done for his servant David. David was dead. But because of what God had done through David and then to them, his people. And too often, I think we think about the story of our life, about uh, what we can make of it and we can achieve. Whereas God wants us to see that we're part of something bigger. We are part of his story. And that is the very best thing ever. It gives a totally different perspective on, on, on life. <coughs> So, as we think about 50 years of Jewsbury Evangelical Church over this, this week and next week, let's not just focus on the specifics of what we are as a church and how God has blessed us as a, as a church in the last 10 years or the last 20 years or the last 50 years, but let's see how those 50 years actually fall inside something far bigger. And that's inside the, the gospel story of what God is doing. And that then will be the source of greatest joy. That's why we're looking this morning at Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 3 to 14. And uh, it's one long sentence of 202 words in Greek uh, where Paul is speaking of the blessings of being a Christian, the blessings of being part of his story. And uh, it's like a, a waterfall of, of blessings. And as Paul just begins, he can't stop. And it just cascades from one thing to, a, to another. And without any punctuation or full stops, it's just like... Bruh! And the response is that we should praise God. Praise God for all our blessings in Christ. God is to be blessed for blessing us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says in verse 3. But in case we miss that, that's what he wants us to do. He says in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. And then again in verse 12, he says that might be for the praise of his glory. And then in verse 14, he ends, to the praise of his glory. So what are we to do with all this great truth, all these great blessings? We're to praise him. It's underlined in red. This should be our response, or to put it in the words of uh, 1 Kings 8.66, be joyful and glad in heart towards God for what he has done. You see, if you're in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you know him, if he is your saviour, then all of these blessings are yours. You know, if somebody very poor marries somebody incredibly rich, at the moment that they're declared to be husband and wife, everything that is his becomes hers, and the other way round. And when we are in Christ, everything that is his 
is ours. You see, becoming a Christian is not a process. You are either in him or you're not in him. And if you are in him and you have faith in him and are trusting in him and know him as your Lord and Saviour, all these things are yours. So this morning we're going to praise God and we're going to, it's, this chapter is very difficult to uh, break down. There's, you could go through and list out all 17 of the blessings, but uh, I think you'd struggle to take home 17 points this morning. Uh, but uh, I've tried to distill it out to four. So four key things. So praise God, he has chosen us to be his children. He has forgiven us by redemption. He has graciously included us in his great plan. He has guaranteed our inheritance by the Holy Spirit. So praise God for choosing us, forgiving us, including us, guaranteeing us. Number one then. He chose us to be his children. Adoption. Verse 4, For he chose us in him, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely given us in the one He loves. The key idea here is adoption. Human adoption is a wonderful thing, isn't it? When a a family say, we will take somebody in and they will become ours with all the blessings and privileges of our family. And uh, there's a need and there is a choosing and it's legal and it's a family. And he tells us that uh, that's what has happened to us. But for a Christian, it goes way, way back. You know, we're thinking 50 years. Where were you 50 years ago? I had just been conceived. But actually, Paul says, forget 50. Before the creation of the world is where you need to go back to if you understand the privilege of belonging to him. That's when it starts, when God takes the initiative and the blessings come from him. And he's unashamed to say then it starts in the heart of God that God has chosen us. He has picked us and God did it. And he has picked us with a with a purpose. He wants us to be holy and blameless in his sight. That is, he wants us to be set apart and clean and acceptable so he can have a a family to enjoy. That's why parents adopt, isn't it? They want children and to provide a, a home and to love and to care for them as their own. That's what God has done then, that we might belong to him be part of his family, be like him, to be adopted as his children, he says. He predestined us, that means chosen, selected us, gave us this destination for adoption to sonship. That was the the aim. It it implies a a full legal standing as as an adopted child. And when an adoption order is signed, they're legally transferred to the parents. They belong to them. Some friends of mine uh, recently adopted a a child. Uh, It was a foster to adopt. So uh, uh, they had the child from the moment the child was born. They picked it up from the hospital just a few hours old. uh, But for the first year then, it wasn't legally theirs. It was still uh, under the local authority. And it's only recently that the thing has gone through and now the child is legally theirs and they have adopted it and it's part of their family and it's a cause of celebration. And God has chosen us for this purpose to be his children. With all the rights and privileges of what that means. 
This friend of mine has other children, but they make no distinction. They're all the same. They all have the same privileges. They're all part of the the family. You know, important and powerful people there, we have restricted access, isn't it? I was talking to a a friend last week, and uh, uh, he's a CEO of a a big company and has a lot of dealings with government. And uh, he was in chatting to a particular minister uh, about some things, having a meeting, and at the end of the meeting, uh, they just started chatting, and the civil servants disappeared out. That's not supposed to happen, but anyway, it did. And then the, the minister said, oh, here's my mobile number. Just call me when you need me. And he's like, whoa, okay. And then like uh, on uh, Christmas Day last year, he, the minister tried to phone him about something. For Christmas, what's he doing? So then he rang him back, left it till later in the day. How's your Christmas? What? And they spent just half an hour just chatting about life and all that was going on in their different uh, uh, families. And uh, then he said, oh, you, you tried to contact. I can't remember why I was trying to ring you now. But, um, but like, do you, can you do that? And then he, like this guy's been sacked now because obviously he didn't vote for the right uh, uh, leadership candidate. But then he showed me the, the exchange they had on, uh, when, after he'd been sacked on, on WhatsApp. Like, I don't have any of that kind of access to government ministers. But I have that kind of access to God. And so do you, because you're his child, if you know him through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our father. We don't have to, you know, sometimes when you're trying to get hold of people, you have to kind of, you play phone tag for days, don't you? Or you have loads of email exchanges just to arrange a phone call to be able to talk to them. Not with God. Any time, any place, because he has chosen us to be his children. And this blessing comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 5 and 6 In love, he predestined for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. That's why the Lord Jesus came and becomes. Ours through faith in him. You you read that in verse 13. You were included when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed. That's how this becomes ours, but it starts in in the heart of God. And it's all motivated by his love. End of verse 4, in love he predestined us. It's all accomplished by his lavish and rich grace, totally undeserved. So praise God for adopting us this morning. This is what you are, a child of the King of Kings. All that is his is yours. Is that not a good reason to go home joyful and glad in heart? This morning, every Sunday morning, Because of what we are in God's sight, we're his children and he has adopted us. But there's more, let's uh, move on. We're just, uh, we're like in a jeweler's shop, aren't we? And and we haven't got time to just like suck all the glory out of one piece of jewellery. There's so much to survey and look at this morning, so we must uh, move on. We could spend all our time just delving those truths. But let's go on to, secondly, he has forgiven us by redemption. The the waterfall, as it were, cascades on and he's got more to tell us. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. You see, when he mentions the fact it was through the Lord Jesus that we have been adopted, it makes him want to speak of what Jesus has done. You, You can almost sort of feel Paul's heart. I'd tell him a bit about adoption. Oh, that's through Jesus. Oh, I better tell him a bit more about what Jesus has done. Redemption. Payment of a price. 
So I heard of a, a preacher who parked his car up somewhere and after the Sunday services came back to find it and it had been towed away. And so uh, he had to go and find it and he had to go to the redemption center to get it and uh, go in there and there was his car and he paid the fee and then it was stamped redeemed and he could have his car back. And we've been redeemed. The price has been paid. We've been held in captivity by our sin. But Christ has paid the price by his blood. And because the reference to blood is telling us about his crucifixion, his death on the cross. And he's saying that by his death then, he was making a, a payment, not to the devil, don't think that that was what was going on, but a, a payment to the justice of God so that we can be forgiven. And so against our account, it is stamped, Against every liability, every sin, it's stamped, redeemed. Christ paid, covered, all of it. I imagine we're all uh, looking carefully at our energy bills. And, uh, you know, they come and this is the amount you've used, and, but you've only made these amounts of payment. There's a falling short got more to pay. You're going to have to increase your direct debit in order to clear the liabilities. Or maybe you've been overpaying and so your bill comes and says it's in credit. But when we look at our account of our sins before God, never in debt. It's all covered. It's all cleared. However big the bill may get. There's no price cap. God is a just God. He sees it all, and yet it's all covered sufficiently by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's dealt with our guilt. He's overcome the forces of darkness which bound us. He's risen in triumph. We are forgiven people. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know, we just read over those words, don't we? Without realizing the huge significance of them. Forgiveness of sin. Every wrong thought, motive, action, every little bit of it covered, paid for, taken, quitted. That's what he does for us. That's our status now. That's why we are blessed people. And we've got uh, great terms here that are mentioned, redemption and blood and forgiveness. And there, if you've read anything of the Old Testament, they're all loaded with meaning from the Old Testament, pointing to the fact that Jesus' death was a sacrifice, that he was paying a price. He was the fulfillment of all those animal sacrifices that took place in the temple. And now the focus is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the full, final, complete, sufficient sacrifice. And when Paul uses those words, he doesn't explain them because he assumes his readers will have some understanding from earlier in the Bible what it's on about. But he wants them to grasp the lavishness of the, the blessings, the wonderful riches the wonder of God's generosity, the abundance of, of it. That's why he says, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that's the forgiveness that we have, that he lavished on us. 
lavish on us. Great word, isn't it? No expense spared. This is the wonder of God's generosity. It's not mean in any sense or just sufficient. It's abundant. That's how God blesses us. He's done everything in, in Christ. No expense spared. It's all of Him. And He wants us then to be captivated by that incredible grace that He has shown. He wants us to join the, the chorus of, of praise to God. Of course, as he'll go on and show in the letter, he wants us to be uh, taken over by that grace and to become gracious people. But uh, for now, he wants us to rejoice and to be glad of heart because of his lavish grace towards us. Are you? Are you able to go home this morning joyful and glad of heart because you're a forgiven person? Paid for by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, he graciously includes us in his great plan. Verses 9 to 13. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity in all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed and you were marked in him with a seal. There's the word included. In verse 13, you were included. Great to be included, isn't it? Rather than excluded or pushed out. Implies a plan. I've given up football now, but uh, I don't know whether this still happens. Those of you that play on a Monday night, but uh, somebody organises it and says it's happening, and then people reply, I'm in. Still happens. It's saying, include me. I'm in the plan. I want to come. I want to run around and kick the ball. Paul is saying, God has an amazing plan for the world, for history and we are included in it. That's what the, the sense of joy that they got when the, in the temple celebration, it wasn't just the moment of the occasion, but it was, this is something bigger. This is what God's great plan, and we are included in it. We're the people of Israel, and we're wondering at it. And uh, Paul is saying, we need to have that same sense of wonder that we're included in this great plan that God has for the history of the world. And you can see all the way through this, he's talking about plans and fulfillment. He talks about, uses words like purposed in verse 9 and verse 10 and plan in verse 11. He also uses the word mystery. We're used to a mystery, aren't we? It's uh, something that's secret. But what he's saying is that this, this plan, there was something mysterious about it, but it's now become clearer. It's become revealed. And that great plan that meanders through the, the Old Testament is, was actually all focused in on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he says, to be put in, verse 10, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity in all things, in heaven and on earth, under Christ. So there's two realms mentioned, heaven where Christ is now and earth where we live now. And God's purpose 
in history relates to the rule of Christ, that he will be seen and accepted as king. And that is what is taking place as people turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what will be complete on that great final day when all acknowledge that Christ is Lord and King. Present, the world is in rebellion and defiance, but not in heaven. And unity is going to be achieved through the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth will come together and will be one, and that's his great plan and purpose. And those of us who have come to know him and acknowledged him as king and as are included in that plan, we are part of what he is doing. And God is not just the God of intention, but of completion. Does not give up. God is making a new people who accept and enjoy his rule. Made up of Jews and Gentiles. He mentions in verses uh, 12 and 13, we, we, the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also, he'll go on to explain in chapter 2, you also who were previously alienated and far off and without God and without hope, you have been included too. You can share in the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying the, the wonder of that uh, great plan to save people from every nation and tribe and tongue has become clear. This is what God is doing. But the point for now is that Jesus is king. He is gathering people around him. And if we have believed, we're in. And that's what ultimately stands behind 50 years of Jewsbury Evangelical Church. That there are people throughout that period of time whom God has been pleased to save and acknowledge his name in this town. We're in. We're in his plan. The greatest event of all time. Through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is making his own people and we're included. And this is a present reality and a future plan. And what should our response be? To praise God. He says in verse 12, might be for the praise of his glory. Praise God that we are included, not excluded. And it's all because of him. Therefore, we can rejoice and be glad of heart. Finally, uh, he has guaranteed our inheritance by the Holy Spirit. Verses End of verse 13 and into verse 14, he says, You are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So through this uh, cascading waterfall of praise, he's actually talked about the past and how God chose us before the foundation of the world, and how Christ died for us. He's talked about the present, how we are the recipients of his lavish grace. We have been adopted and included, and now he's talking about the future. An inheritance. That's something that gets passed on, isn't it? From generation to generation. Might be wealth. That's what we often think about it as, isn't it? That uh, the wealth accumulated by one generation is passed on to the next generation. But it could also be a title. Now they've started doing away with those now, but uh, if you're Lord or Baron or whatever or something, then it might be a title that gets passed on. And you inherit it. Or a business. 
that uh, a family business that uh, gets passed on to the next generation. Well, in Christ then, we have an inheritance, he says. Something that's going to be passed on to us. All the things that God promised through the Old Testament. To the, the land and to know God and to be a nation. All of those become ours to have and to enjoy. Because all that is Christ will be ours to have and enjoy. We will be perfect with him. We will be his. A deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And this future, this prospect of uh, this glorious eternity with God without sin, in this world full of uh, blessing and uh, no sin that he is making is not in doubt, it is guaranteed. Verse 13, he's given us, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, and given a, a mark, a mark of ownership, that we belong to him, the Holy Spirit then is the, the security of the forgiveness and the assurance that we belong to God. And one of his roles then is to mark us out, that we are his. You know, you put down a deposit, don't you, to secure something. And you do it on the understanding that if you don't complete, you lose it. A few years ago, we paid a deposit, it wasn't very much, so I didn't mind losing it, uh, on a ferry. And we, then we changed our minds that we weren't going to go to France and come back a different route. And so we cancelled it, but we lost a £35 deposit. Just glad I didn't have to pay the other three, four hundred. So, but that's how deposits work, isn't it? And... Uh, God has put down something. Now, God isn't going to say, oh, I'm just going to let it go, because his deposit is his Holy Spirit. And so the point is that God is not going to give up or let it drop. He is guaranteeing that he will see it through to completion. He is invested in it. The EMF used to own this uh, building called Gessens, great big manor house. And um, I lived there as a, a kid. And anyway, uh, it was becoming a millstone around our necks, and we sold it. And, uh, but we sold it to a developer who had fallen in love with it. And uh, it was far more. Uh, cost and hassle, I think, than even he realised. But he would not give up. His son, who was in business, said, Dad, just forget it. It's costing us too much. We're going to lose money. It's a nightmare. Let's get out. He was invested. He'd fallen in love with it. He wasn't going to... He just could not let it go. And, like, he's done an absolutely fantastic job on it. But he just could not let it go. And God just cannot let us go. He is so invested in us and our future. That's why he's given us his Holy Spirit to guarantee our future. What should our response be? Again, praise, to the praise of his glory. As you think about all that's in store for us in the future, and as he works out his, his plan. So this chapter is full of reasons to praise God. We've kind of tried to highlight four as we've worked our way down the waterfall or gone round the jeweler's shop and looking at all these precious blessings, adoption, redemption, inclusion in the great plan and a guaranteed inheritance. But even four is hard to remember, isn't it? So let's distill it down to one. 
we belong to God. Verse 14. Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. We belong to God. That's what adoption means. We're his child. It cost him to redeem us. He has a plan. We're going to be, enjoy our inheritance, but it's all because we belong to God. All these blessings are ours in Christ. Well, I hope as you think about these things, as the Holy Spirit, I trust, presses them on your heart, you'll be able to go home joyful and glad in heart. And as we celebrate 50 years of God's goodness, that we'll come back to this great reality that stands behind it all. We belong to God. Let's pray. Thank you, our God, for this rich passage which we've just dipped into this morning. So many phrases, concepts, ideas that we've not been able to plumb the depths of, but Lord, I pray that something of the glorious wonder of what it means to be yours will have been pressed upon our hearts this morning. Lord, fill us with praise and thanksgiving for your lavish and incredible grace and the fact that we belong to you. I pray for any who are here who do not yet belong to you. Lord, draw them in. I pray for any whose hearts may have gone cold May they see the wonder of the gospel. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing, come praise and glorify. And uh, this song is based on these words. So uh, uh, we've read it at least twice, if not three times, and now we're going to sing it. So just trying to get the reality of this passage into our hearts. So let's sing it together now with the words of come praise and glorify.
seats. If you're watching this as a recording, that's the end of the service. Thank you for